Hello everyone, this week we learn consumer choice and elasticity. These two concepts are very important and please pay attention and understand them very well. So first, let's talk about fundamentals of consumer choice. There are factors affecting choice. First of all, we have limited income, so we have to choose between different alternatives we have. Second, consumers make choices purposefully, so that means if you equally like pizza and steak, you may choose pizza because it's cheaper, so you're actually acting as a rational person when you make choices. The third one, one good can be substituted for another. So, for example, if you like Coke, but the Coke prices are increasing, then you can substitute with another brand of soda. And the fourth one, consumers must make decisions without perfect information, but knowledge and past experience will help. So, most of the time, acquiring information is costly. So finding the perfect information might be not easy, but what we do is we actually make decisions by knowledge or the past experience and that helps us to find the right combination of goods to buy. And here we have a one important theory that I want you to understand, which is law of diminishing marginal utility. So what does that mean? As the rate of consumption increases, the marginal utility derived from consuming additional units of a good will decline. So this is a very simple com concept. So let's think about drinking water. You are too thirsty, you drink one glass of water, you're satisfied. And then the second glass of water may not going to give you the same amount of satisfaction as the first one. So as you see, additional glass of water is actually gives less and less satisfaction or the utility. That is called diminishing marginal utility. The marginal here is because you are adding additional amount of goods to consume, like one glass of water and then you drink one more glasses and that additional utility is going down. So let's talk about marginal utility, consumer choice and the demand curve of an individual. They are all related. First, let's, let's remember what the demand curve is. Demand curve shows the relation between prices and the amount of goods purchased. And the height of an individual demand curve indicates the maximum price the consumer would be willing to pay for that unit. A consumer's willingness to pay for a unit of a good is directly related to the utility derived from consumption of that unit. And we know that there is law of diminishing marginal utility, which implies that a consumer's marginal benefit and thus the height of their demand curve falls with the rate of consumption. Let's understand that on this figure. Now you see on the screen Jonas demand curve for frozen pizza. And as you see on this figure, Jonas willing to pay is willing to pay $3.5 for the first pizza and for the second pizza Jonas is willing to pay $3 as you see the height of the the height here let me show here the height here see this is the marginal benefit of consuming the first pizza so he is enjoying as much as $3.5 from eating the first pizza and the second, as you see, the second pizza, the marginal benefit is going down. Why? Because law of diminishing marginal utility. Why? The first pizza satisfies more and the second pizza you might feel like, okay, maybe I'm good for today. Or you might say, even if you're eating pizza for a week, you buy three pizzas, you might say second night of the week you eat pizza, but you don't get as much benefit as the first night you eat pizza in that week. So here the marginal benefit is as much as three three dollars. And finally, the third pizza gives him $2.5 of marginal benefit. So how many pizzas Jonas is going to buy? Depends on the price, okay? So here's a rational decision maker, right? Makes decision purposefully, compares the cost and the benefit, but this is marginal benefit, this is marginal cost. So the cost of pizza is $2.5 and the marginal benefit he's getting from the third pizza is 2.5 so he's going to consume or buy three pizzas why what is the decision here he's going to consume or buy the pizzas as long as marginal benefit equals the marginal cost at that point he's getting as much benefit as he spends money he's going to buy the first pizza he's going to buy the second pizza and he's going to buy the third pizza so a consumer will purchase until MB equals price. And at 2.5, Jonas would purchase three frozen pizzas and receive a consumer surplus shown by the shaded area. Here, if you remember the consumer surplus, 
it's the area above the price below the demand curve this area represents consumer surplus or you might think about this way okay he spends 3.5 i'm sorry he spends 2.5 but it benefits the pizza benefits to him 3.5 so he's getting one dollar consumer surplus or bargain here and from the second pizza he's getting 0.5 dollar and the third pizza zero so the total consumer surplus from the first one second point five and the third one is zero for a total of 1.5 dollars so what if you have more than one goods if you have many goods most of the time when you think about buying something you always think about okay if i spend money to buy a t-shirt let's say it's 50 dollars what I could do with that $50 if I decided not to purchase that t-shirt, right? So you're comparing one good to another or you're thinking about bundles of goods. If that is the case, the key point is marginal utility per dollars you spend. Bank for buck, okay? How much utility you get if you spend $1 on the t-shirt, okay? So what is the optimal solution optimal solution is you compare for instance here t-shirt marginal utility of the t-shirt divided by the price of t-shirt and let's say your alternative is going to a theater per price of the theater and when actually these utilities are the same then you maximize your utility so if you don't understand this optimization or what is the best solution uh, for utility maximization. I want you to think this way. So let's say you have $10, okay? And you go to a restaurant, you ask for wings, and wings portion is $2, so you buy four portion. And soda, a big soda is $2 as well, and you buy one. So you eat the first portion, and then you get benefits from wings, second portion, third portion, but maybe you're so full that you cannot even fourth portion. So let's assume each of them has six wings in it, okay? Six wings, six wings, and six wings. So you're not making the optimal decision here because instead of spending money on, the, on all four portions of chicken, maybe you can get three portions of chicken and two big sodas. So what happened here is that here the marginal utility per dollars you spend since soda and the chicken are the same price here uh, we don't maybe need to use even price is less than marginal utility that you receive from soda divided by price of soda so how you can make this better you can buy more soda which will actually reduce the marginal utility remember additional product is actually reduces the marginal utility you consume the first pizza you enjoy more your second one uh, you have less marginal benefit so here marginal utility or the marginal benefit when you buy more pizza is going to go down when you buy less wings the marginal utility of wings is going to increase and at the end you will have the equilibrium this is wings price wings equals marginal utility of soda divided by price of soda so this is how you make decision in consumer theory if you have bundles of goods now, we know that the demand curve shows the amount of a product consumers will be willing to buy at different prices for a specific period. And we also know that the law of demand states that there is an inverse relationship between the quantity of a product purchased and its price. So why do we have that relation? Remember, this is our demand curve and it's downward sloping. This is the price, this is the quantity. When price gets lower, you buy more, but when price increases, you buy less. As you see, at price here, you buy this much at a lower price you buy this much right so two reasons substitution effect as the product's price falls it becomes cheaper relative to alternatives and the consumer will buy more of it and less of other now more expensive products second one is income effect as a product's price falls let's say your rent goes down by hundred dollars you have hundred dollars extra month to spend on other goods right so when the price of the rent falls, you can purchase more of other goods. Uh, so that, that gives an idea of how income effect affects the demand curve. And also time cost is an important 
element in consumer decision, the monetary price of a good is not always a complete measure of its cost to the consumer. Consumption of most goods requires time as well as money. Like money, time is scarce to the consumer. So, for instance, let's say you want to go to a concert and to get a cheap ticket you have to wait in the line. Let's say cheap ticket is $10. But if you have to wait, let's assume you have to wait in line for 3 hours. But then if you don't wait in the line, you can get the same ticket $40. So this decision making depends on how much you value of your time. If you value of your time, that means that you're a busy person, you don't have time, you can use that time to earn more income, then you might choose to buy the ticket at the moment. Otherwise, you may choose to wait in the line. So there are questions here that you can work on your own. And now we come to the market demand and uh, that which reflects the demand of individual consumers. So let's look at here on the screen, you see the demand for pizza for Jonas and Smith. And we know that at $3.5, Jonas wants to buy one pizza, Smith wants to buy two pizzas. At $2.5, Jonas wants to buy three pizza and Smith wants to buy three pizza as well. So how we can get the demand curve? So first of all, what is the demand curve? Demand curve is the sum of all buyers demand in the market. How we can find it's very easy. Here you see at this Jonas wants to buy one and Simit wants to buy two. So at $3.5 we sum the total, we sum the demand of Jonas and Smith, which is three. At 3.5 we have three. And at 2.5 Jonas three, Smith three, that is six. At 2.5 it is six. So as you see, the market demand curve is merely the horizontal sum of the individual demand curves, which in this case, Jonas and Smith. The market demand curve will slope downward to the right, just like the individual demand curves. Now we move to another important concept, which is elasticity of demand. So first let's understand what we mean by elasticity. We know that when the price increases, first let's start here the quantity demanded is going to go down, right? This is law of demand. But the question is, how much the quantity declines? And this question can be answered by the elasticity. We know the direction. Yes, the quantity is going to go down when the price increases, or in the reverse case, when the price decreases, quantity demanded increases. But how much is answered by price elasticity of demand? So by how much we are actually measuring how sensitive the, uh, the customers to a price change. So let me give you an example so that you can understand what we mean by elasticity. For instance, let's say you go to a grocery store and you look at the cereal brands and your favorite one is Kellogg's, but Kellogg's suddenly increased the price from $4 to $6. And you say, while well, buying Kellogg's, maybe uh, better, cheaper alternatives, and you find a cheaper alternative. So there are many, many cereal brands in the grocery store. So if one brand increases the prices, you can immediately switch to buy another. So that means you are very price sensitive. Very price sensitive means, okay, a change in the price, you can switch to another product. But now let's think about insulin pill, okay? You need it, right? Whatever for to survival, you need an insulin pill. So let's say the price of insulin pill increases from 100 to 150. Are you going to give up using insulin pill? No, it's not the case. Okay. So as you see here, you are not price sensitive, right? So if you are not price sensitive, you continue to consume, but maybe sometimes you consume less, but still, you're not going to change your consumption decision too much. But if it's very price sensitive, there will be huge change in quantity demanded when the price changes. Okay. So the first case, which you are very sensitive is called elastic. And the second case, it's called inelastic. Okay. Inelastic, you're not sensitive. Elastic, you are sensitive. So how do we find price elasticity of demand? It's a simple formula or a ratio. It's the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by percentage change in price. So let's say if the price increases by 10% and the quantity demanded 
decreases by 20%, then the elasticity turns out to be 2. So any price elasticity is greater than 1 is called price elastic. Any elasticity is less than 1 is called inelastic. So given this example, if the price increases 10%, but the quantity decreases by 5%, you see a change in the price is much higher than the change in quantity, then this product is inelastic because the result is 0.5, which is less than 1. Okay? So it's very easy to find price elasticity of demand if you have the percentages, but what if you don't have the percentages but just the points on a demand curve? If that is the case, we are going to use this formula here on the screen. Q0 minus Q1 divided by Q0 plus Q1. Q is representing here the quantity, change in quantity from one point to another. And P represents the price, changing price from one point to another. So to understand this formula, let's do an example. Here, suppose Trina bakes speciality cakes. She can sell 50 speciality cakes per week at $7 a cake or 70 speciality cakes per week at $6 a cake. So we have one point. Q0 is 50 and P0 the price at that quantity is 7 and there's Q1 which is 70 and at that quantity the price is $6. So we just need to plug the numbers, right? Let's do a first percentage change in quantity demanded. Q0 which is 50 minus Q1 divided by Q0 plus Q1 over 2 and minus 20 divided by 60 negative 33.33%. And let's do that for percentage change in price. 7, P07, minus P16, divided by P0 plus P1, 7 plus 6 over 2, 1 over 6.5, which is 15.38%. So what is the price elasticity? The ratio of percentage change in quantity, percentage change in price, negative 33.33 divided by 15.38, which is negative 2.17. So one thing here you have to be careful. We never look at the sign of the elasticity if it is price elasticity of demand. We always assume that magnitude, which is 2, is important here, or the absolute value of the elasticity. So absolute value of negative 2.17 is 2.17. Since this magnitude is greater than 1, this good is price elastic. Okay. If this magnitude is less than 1, then it's price inelastic. So after calculating the price elasticity of demand, you determine whether it's elastic, inelastic, or unitary elastic with the following. If the absolute value of the elasticity term is less than 1, then the demand is elastic. If the absolute value of the elasticity term is greater than 1, then the demand is elastic. If the absolute value of the elasticity term is equal to 1, then the demand is unitary elastic. Because price elasticity of demand is always negative, the sign on the coefficient is often omitted in the discussions of elasticity. So we can check the elasticity of demand on a curve too. If you have a perfectly inelastic, that means, okay, whatever the price, price is $200, you buy the same quantity. Price is $1,000, you buy the same quantity. Or the demand curve looks like letter I, then this is perfectly inelastic. Whatever the change in price, if you change the price infinite amount, still you are going to buy 10. Okay, That's why it's called perfectly inelastic. Relatively inelastic, the curve is still steeper. It looks like letter I. But again, change the price from 100, double it to 200. Look at the change in quantity demanded. It's, not, it's very narrow, right? It's very small. So as you see here, the consumer is not price elastic. Yeah, there is, we see that there is a decrease in the consumption, but it's not as much as change in the price, right? Change in quantity demanded is much small. Unitary elastic, you have actually either curve like this or a linear line, and the percentage change in quantity demanded due to an increase in price is equal to the percentage change in price. A decreasing slope results sales revenue price times quantity is constant. Relatively elastic, if you see a curve like a sleeping eye, like flat, then it is relatively elastic. Why? Let's look at here. If you increase the price, let's say 100, from 100 to 200, look how much the quantity changes. Look at this distance compared to distance, right? Consumers are price elastic. 
So the quantity changes more than the change in the price. And if it's perfectly elastic, it's a horizontal demand curve at a certain price, let's say $100. And even you change a very, very, very small the price, you'll lose all your customers. That's what perfectly elastic means. Okay. And elasticity of demand may be different on a demand curve. Okay, at lower prices, although you have the same change in price, you might see that consumers are more actually behaving like inelastic. At higher prices, even you change the price, the same amount, consumers behave like the product is more price elastic. So here, the price increases from one to two at lower prices, okay? And the quantity drops from 110 to 100, and the elasticity is 0.14. We need to take the absolute value. So this is inelastic, less than one. Okay. Now let's look at the same curve, same good, but this time at higher prices, the price increases from 10 to 11. It's still the one dollar change, but look what happens. Quantity decreases from 20 to 10. That gives us an elasticity of seven, which is elastic. Okay, so the price elasticity of a straight line demand curve increases as price rises for the same good. The next question is, what are the determinants of price elasticity of demand? First of all, availability of substitutes. If you have lots of alternatives, when the price increases, you can easily switch to another product. When good substitutes for a product are available, a rise in the price induces many consumers to switch to another product. The greater the availability of substitutes, the more elastic demand will be. Next one, share of total budget expanded on product. As the share of the total budget spent on the product increases, demand is more elastic. Just think about coffee. Coffee prices increase 10% compared to rent increases 10%, right? Coffee prices increasing 10%, you might say, I don't care, I'm going to consume my coffee, one cup of coffee every day. But for rent, it's not the same. 10% increase, you might think about, let me find another place to live. You see, share of total budget is a significant factor. Elastic and inelastic demand. Here, as the price of half pound hamburgers rises from four to six dollars, Quantity demanded plunges from 100k to 25k per week. The percentage fall in quantity demanded is larger, as you see here, it's obvious, right? This distance is larger, percentage change, than the increase in price. Here, that distance, percentage change in quantity is larger than the percentage change in price. So therefore, demand for one over two pound hamburgers is relatively elastic. Let's look at this case. The price increases this much, you see, and the quantity changes this much. This time, percentage change in quantity is much less than percentage change in price. If that is the case, then the demand is relatively inelastic. Time and demand elasticity. If the price of a product increases, consumers will reduce their consumption by a larger amount in the long run than in the short run. Let's understand this with gasoline prices. So when gasoline prices are rising, okay, people continue to consume gas. They maybe consume less, maybe, but they continue to keep their car. But in the long run, they can actually sell their car and buy an electric or hybrid car. So they are going to decrease their consumption more in the long run because in the long run, you have more options. In the short run, you might be limited in terms of decision making. So let's look at some price elasticity of demand for selective goods. Salt, as you see, not too many alternatives, very low elasticity. Matches, toothpicks, Erulan, travel short run is very inelastic. Gasoline in the short run is very inelastic, but long run it's relatively more better, but still inelastic. Natural gas, the same short run and long run. Coffee is inelastic. Fish, inelastic. Tobacco products, short run is inelastic. And uh, elastic ones, restaurant meals, foreign travel, long run, airline travel, long run, fresh green peas, automobiles, Chevrolet automobiles, fresh tomatoes are all elastic ones. So the next section we will talk about how demand elasticity and price changes affect total expenditures on a product. This is an important concept that you need to understand. 
So this table summarizes the relations, okay? It says that when the price elasticity of demand is elastic, that means it's from one to infinity. Impact of price on total consumer expenditures, if the price decreases, total revenue increase. So let's understand this. This might be a little bit confusing, but let's see total revenue first, right? Total revenue is price times quantity. So if the good is elastic, percentage change in price, let's say this arrow, quantity demanded, let's assume this is a decrease, right? And quantity demanded will increase more than the increase in price. You see, the direction is increased because of the law of demand when it's getting cheaper. Let's say percent change in price in 10%. And quantity demanded increases, let's say, by 20%. So the dominant factor here is quantity demanded. Whatever the sign of quantity demanded, total revenue will change in that direction. So if the, if the prices decreases, quantity demanded increases more than the change in price, which is a positive sign, so total revenue will increase. So what does that mean? So if you are in an inelastic, I'm sorry, if you are in an elastic market for a good that has an elastic demand, the best strategy to increase revenue is to sell more, but to sell more, you have to decrease price. When the price decreases, you get lots of consumers. The quantity demanded increases more than the decrease in price, so you will get more money. So if, for instance, on the commercials, you usually see a lot of um, advertisement on hamburgers that are on sale, furnitures on sale, cars on sale, because these are all products that are price elastic. Why they do this promotions? Because they want to sell cheap, but sell more so that to increase, they will increase the company's revenue. If it's an inelastic good, inelastic, okay. If you increase the price, Quantity demanded is not is going to go down, but is not going to go as much as the change in price. So the dominant one is here the price. So the price is going to determine what is going to happen to total revenue. P times Q here. And now the price is the dominant because the quantity change, maybe if the price increases 10%, quantity change is 2% decrease. So which one is dominant price? So price has a positive in impact price has a more impact than quantity demanded. Therefore, an increase in price, which is positive here, is going to decrease demand. But since this side is much bigger, have an impact, much more impact on total revenue, total revenue has a positive sign. So the idea here is that if you increase the price in an inelastic good, which is in zero to one, then the total revenue is going to increase, which is this wrong, right? So total revenue and the price moves in the same direction for inelastic goods. So if you work for an insulin pill company, then the better strategy is not to decrease the price, but to increase the price because people still consume more or less the same amount. So the company's total revenue is going to be increasing when you increase the price. And finally, I'm going to talk about two additional elasticity is. The first one is the income elasticity. Income elasticity indicates the responsiveness of a product's demand to a change in income. So let's say your income increases and you buy more of coke, soda. So the demand for coke increases with the income, right? You want to measure how sensitive consumers are to change in income on percentage change in quantity demanded. So the sign of income elasticity is important, okay? We, we cannot say we, we will ignore the sign and just take the absolute value. If it's a positive sign, you find a positive sign after calculating using this equation, then the good is actually a normal good. That means your income increases, you buy more of that good. It's a normal good. As income expands, the demand for normal goods will rise. But if you find a negative sign, that means your income increases, you buy less of that good, okay, then the good is inferior. Like for instance, you get richer, maybe you stop buying $1 meal from McDonald's, right? So what happens is that McDonald's $1 meal 
is actually inferior to your income. And income elasticity of demand, you can see low income elasticity, margarine, fuel, electricity, fish, food, tobacco, and hospital care. High income elasticity, private education, new cars, recreation, and amusement, and alcohol. Why is the income elasticity of demand for some goods greater than for others? What does it mean that the income elasticity of demand for margarine is negative? So negative means it's an inferior good, right? Because when you have more income, you buy less margarine. And uh, the interpretation is the same for the magnitude. If you have a number greater than one, that means you're, uh, you're highly elastic, very income sensitive to buy that product, okay? And the last elasticity is price elasticity of supply. The price elasticity of supply is the percentage change in quantity supply divided by percentage change of the price causing the supply response. So percentage change in quantity is the same here, but the only difference is this is quantity supplied, not demand. Percentage change in price is the supply elasticity. So if the percentage change in quantity is small relative to percentage change in price, supply is inelastic. If the percentage change in quantity is large relative to the percentage change in price, supply is elastic. But just one difference between demand and supply elasticity, uh, you're always going to find positive supply elasticity because when the price increases, quantity supplied increases. So both positive, always you will have a positive sign here. So one last thing, what determines the price elasticity of supply? Uh, think about one example, let's say beachfront properties, okay? So beachfront properties are actually inelastic in terms of price elasticity of supply. Why is the case? Because even the price goes to 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, you have very limited places that you can build beachfront houses. So price might tri triple, quadruple, but the amount of houses available supplied to the market may not change too much. That's an example of inelastic. Okay, so there are questions here for you. And this is the end of chapter 20. Thank you.